Hello everyone. I've gathered you here today to talk about crosscut sleds. A good crosscut sled is the most important accessory for your table saw, and it makes the saw that much more versatile of a tool. Out of the box, table saws are great for rip cutting, but with a good crosscut sled, they also become great for cross cutting. This is especially true for small table saws like this, which usually come with a pretty dinky miter gauge that is practically useless for accurate cross cutting. Keyword there being accurate. Now for really long boards like this, you're still gonna be better off using a miter saw because it's just gonna be hard to support the end of a board like this on a table saw sled. But for small to medium sized boards, a crosscut sled like this is great. This table saw was one of the first tools I bought when I got into woodworking. And in the first shed that I used as a wood shop, I didn't have room for a miter saw. So I learned to leverage my table saw for as much as I could. And I found that a crosscut sled was key to this. Beyond this, there are two other really big advantages of crosscut sleds. The first is that they leave you with really clean cuts with minimal tear out because they provide support and zero clearance to the two sides of the workpiece that the blade is exiting through. The other benefit of a crosscut sled is the ability to clamp on a stop block so that you can make repeated cuts that are all the same length. Let's back up though and talk about what matters when it comes to building a good crosscut sled. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a pretty basic quick and easy crosscut sled but the same design could be built upon to integrate more features into it. Now, whether you're going to build a basic crosscut sled or something a little fancier, there are a few things you want to consider about the size and materials before you start building. In its most basic form, a crosscut sled consists of a base, a back fence that is going to be perfectly square to the blade, a front fence that adds support to the whole sled, especially once the base gets cut in half by the blade, and then some runners that are gonna go along the bottom and slide in the grooves on your table saw. The whole thing can be made from plywood, but there are a few other material options. So for your base, you want something that's gonna be flat and smooth. And considering the size, plywood or MDF are gonna be your two most viable options here. This is a piece of three quarter inch plywood, and that's just what I had on hand left over from other projects, but I think half inch material is the best. There are two reasons why I think it's better to use half inch material than three quarter inch material. The first is just that the whole thing's gonna be lighter, and the second is that you're gonna have a quarter inch more on your maximum cut height you can do with the sled. So the size of your base piece basically determines the size of the whole thing and you can make your crosscut sled as small or as large as you want. Now, the depth of the base is going to determine the widest board you can cut. The length of it, though, doesn't necessarily determine the longest board you can cut because your workpiece can overhang to either side. But the length of it, along with the length of the fence, does determine how far over you can clamp a stop block. And this is often why you'll see sleds overhang on one side, because that gives you longer distance to be able to clamp a stop block. There really isn't a right and wrong size to make your sled. What I will say though, is if you have a smaller table saw like me, and you make a really, really big crosscut sled, it might get a little unruly to work with. If you make a really big sled, thinking about those occasional really large cuts, you might find it inconvenient to use the rest of the time. And since these sleds are pretty easy to make in the first place, a better option might just be to make a small one and a large one. For me, this sled feels pretty good for this size table saw, and I actually have a smaller crosscut sled that's good for smaller cuts. This one here is 18 inches deep by 24 inches wide. Just slightly wider might have been nice, but this was the widest piece of plywood I had on hand. Now, I plan to offset it to the side like this, and that'll give me just a little over 16 inches for clamping a stop block off to this side. If I need to make repetitive cuts longer than this, I'll turn to my miter saw instead. 
Next up we have the fence. Plywood is probably the simplest choice here, but if you have the right tools, a nice hardwood can also be good for this. I'm going to laminate two pieces of three quarter inch plywood together to create an inch and a half thick piece, and that is solid enough to make a good fence on your sled. If you're working with half inch material, you probably want to laminate three pieces together. A nice thick piece of hardwood like maple could also make for a really solid durable fence, but only if you have a jointer and planer so that you can get it milled perfectly square. And in that case, what you're going to want to do is get it milled roughly, let it acclimate to your shop, and then mill it to those final dimensions and get it perfectly square. I don't have a jointer and planer, so it's plywood for me. I would definitely avoid softwoods here as they're going to be the least durable and the most prone to warping. The other thing to think about with the fence is the height of the fence. I like to make it tall enough that I can do a cut through the whole sled with my table saw blade at its max height and not cut my sled in half. So in my case, I have a 3 quarter inch base and then I have a fence that's 3.5 inches tall. The max height on my blade is just a little bit over 3 inches, so with this, if I do a cut at full blade height, I'm going to have over an inch of material left to hold the two sides together. So that's going to be nice and strong. This also means that I will have a max cut height of about two and a quarter inches. If this were a half inch material for the base, like I said earlier, then you'd get an extra quarter inch for that max cut height. Last up, we have the runners that are going to be on the base of our sled. And these are quite important because we need these to slide without wiggling in these slots. If there's wiggle in our sled, then we're not going to get square cuts every time. Again, we want to avoid softwoods here. Plywood can work, but I think a hardwood is going to be the most durable over time. I'm going to go with maple for mine, which is a really solid choice for your runners. For the thickness of these, you want them to be just slightly thinner than the depth of these slots on the top of your table saw. So normally this means just a little bit thinner than 3 eighths of an inch. For the width, you can make them so that they are the perfect width that slides without being too loose in the slot, but I think it's easier to instead cut them a little bit undersized and then what we'll do is when we're gluing them to the base, we're going to snug them either to the inside edge or to the outside edge in order to let our base slide without wiggling. I'll show you how to get these glued on just right when we get to the assembly. Another option here, and perhaps the most durable and accurate in the long run, is to buy pre-made aluminum runners. And there's a few companies that sell these exactly for the purpose of making your own sleds. I'll put a link down in the video description to a set of these. Okay, so now let's actually build this thing. I already have my pieces cut, but if you don't, the first step would be to gather your materials and cut out your pieces. From here, the first thing I'll start with is gluing together the fence pieces so that these can dry while we work on the next parts. I started by adding wood glue to both sides. Then I put the two sides together, lined them up, and shot a brad nail into each corner. The brad nails will keep the boards from sliding when we add the clamps. This is my favorite method for keeping things aligned during a glue up like this. I used the level in between the boards and the clamps. This plywood was fairly flat, but had a slight bow to it. The level will act as a straight edge to keep the boards flat until the glue has dried. I then repeated the process for the smaller fence but didn't use a straight edge here. This piece is just for support and not a reference edge while cutting, so it's okay if it isn't completely flat. Okay, so I have the pieces for my fences in the clamps glued up and drying now. But while I was gluing these up, I realized I made a mistake. And that is I had cut these pieces to their final size before gluing up. And while I tried to get them aligned as best I could, they're not aligned perfectly. And so what I'll need to do, and this is kind of common, is after the glue dries, I'll need to trim these just a little bit to recreate a square edge on this end and then make that match on this end. And I'll probably clean up the ends while I'm at it. So what I should have done is first cut these to where they were oversized by about a quarter inch on each dimension. 
and then that would have allowed me to trim off about an eighth of an inch at every side and get it to the perfect final dimension. It'll be okay, it'll just end up a little bit smaller than I had planned. All right, let's keep going. Now for the runners. I had already cut these roughly to size. The thickness is just right, just slightly thinner than the slots in the table saw, but the width was too tight and they didn't slide easily. I adjusted the fence on my table saw to trim off just a hair and then cut them down. Now they were sliding easily. At this point, I went ahead and pre-drilled and countersunk four holes in each for the screws that will secure them to the base. Now we'll get ready to glue the first runner to the base. Since they are thinner than the slots in the table, we need to shim them up while we glue them. I used some popsicle sticks for this, but pennies also work. Before adding glue, do a quick test fit to confirm how you want to position the base. To glue them down, I'm going to use a combination of wood glue for the long term strength, but super glue which will quickly cure to hold the runners in place until we add the screws. So as I added the wood glue, I left some little gaps where I could add dots of super glue. Now I put the base on top and applied pressure for about a minute to let the super glue dry to a firm grip. I find gluing this on one runner at a time easier than trying to do both at once. At this point, we can carefully pick up the base and flip it over. I'm going to add clamps for some extra security so that the runners won't move while we add the screws. Then we can pre-drill through the base and add our screws. The screws will keep the runner solidly in place while the wood glue dries. Be sure to clean up any squeeze out at this point. So we can see that the base and runner slide well, but have some wiggle. We will align the second runner to the inside of the slot and add pressure while gluing to eliminate this wiggle by having both runners hug the inside edge of the slots. To do this, I'm going to use some folded up pieces of paper to shim the second runner firmly towards the inside edge of the slot. Now we can add our same glue combination as before, get the runner in place, set the base on top, and add pressure. This time, we need to add both downward pressure and sideways pressure to pull our first runner toward the inside edge of its slot. Once the super glue has set, we can flip it and add our screws. Test how it slides immediately. If something is off, you want to be able to undo it before the wood glue has really dried. If the runners are too snug, you can carefully sand a little bit off those inside edges. At this point, my fence pieces have had ample time to dry and we can unclamp them. The straight edge did its job and the back fence came out perfectly flat. Now I'll use the track saw to clean up one edge on each of the fences. If you don't have a track saw, you could also use a circular saw and a straight edge or a table saw and a jointing sled for this. Since I didn't start with these boards oversized, I'm only trimming off a sliver less than the kerf of the blade. Now we can move to the table saw and clean up the remaining edges. During all this, be sure to watch out for the brad nails in the corners. When you add those brad nails during the glue up, position them more than a quarter inch from the edges to avoid any problems here. The next step is to attach the front fence. Here I'm clamping it in place to pre-drill holes. After this, we can add wood glue, reclamp, and then screw it down. Be sure to think about where the blade is going to travel and add your screws well away from this. In my case, I added a screw just inside each of the runners. Now I'm marking and pre-drilling the holes for the back fence. Only pre-drill these through the base. Do not drill through the fence at this time. 
Next, we will take the sled to the table saw and cut through the back fence and through most of the base, but stop before you get to the back edge. We will use this cut to align our back fence, but we don't want to fully cut through the base until the back fence is on. During this part, I went ahead and clamped my straight edge back onto the fence to make sure it stays straight. Now we can clamp our fence on and use a square to align it to the curve. I used an engineering square here because it's the biggest square I have that I trust is accurate. At this step, we want to get it as close to square as possible, but we'll still be testing and adjusting after this. Now, I pre-drill and put a screw at one end of the fence only. Alright, so let me explain where we're at and what we're going to do to get this fence set as square as possible. So what I've done so far is I went ahead and pre-drilled the hole and put the screw into this side of the fence. So this side of the fence is attached. I then used a square and I aligned the fence as square as I could based on this kerf we cut in the base. The far end of the fence though, I've only attached with the clamp. I haven't put a screw in that end yet. Now what we'll do is we'll make a test cut to measure how accurate our fence is using the five cut method and then we'll make any adjustments we need to the fence. All right, let's go ahead and cut our first test piece and then I'll explain the rest. The procedure for testing the squareness of the fence goes like this. First, get a scrap piece of wood and align it to cut a small bit off one side. Now rotate it so that the freshly cut side is against the fence. Again, we will align it to cut off a small bit of the second side. And again, we will repeat this, moving the freshly cut side to the fence each time. When using your sled, be sure to keep all your fingers on both hands well away from the blade, and don't forget about where the blade exits the sled at the back. After four cuts, we'll be back to the first side. Now we want to cut off a wider strip. The exact width doesn't matter, but aim for about an inch wide. On that fifth cut, I cut off a thicker strip from the workpiece, and then I measured it to figure out what the air is in the fence. So this end of this strip was about an eighth of an inch wider than this end. Now what's cool about the five cut method is it creates an accumulative air, and this makes it easier to measure. So the air you have in this final strip is actually four times the air of any one cut. So this means that my actual air in the fence would be one eighth of an inch divided by four, which is one thirty second of an inch, over the length of this piece, about 10 inches. So that's how much we need to adjust our fence. The second thing we need to figure out is which direction we need to adjust our fence. Now, this top side of our test piece here came out thicker. So that would be the equivalent of the board being slanted like this, which would put more of the board across the blade on this top end of the piece. So this board being slanted like this would be like our fence being out of alignment where it's angled like this. So what we need to do is we need to adjust it where we move this end of the fence this way. And you know this is our pivot point, so we're gonna loosen it here and make our adjustment to this end. So this five cut method is probably the most common method for checking the squareness of a fence like this. If you want more details and a further breakdown of the math involved in it to really precisely adjust your fence, I'll link in the video description to the video from who I believe is the originator of this method. In my case, I don't have working digital calipers or ways to make really precise adjustments, so I'm trying to simplify this all just a little bit. So we've already determined which direction we need to move our fence and by how much. And what we said is that 10 inches down, we need to scoot it over 1 32nd of an inch in this direction. Now 1 32nd of an inch is a pretty small amount, but it's a doable amount for an adjustment. To make that an even easier adjustment to make, we can increase the length over which we're gonna move the fence. So 1 32nd of an inch over 10 inches would be the same as 1 16th of an inch over 20 inches. Now from this point here to the end of my fence isn't quite a full 20 inches. It's about 18 inches. So that would mean at the end of my fence, I need to move it just a little bit under a 16th of an inch. So that's what we'll do. We'll make a mark 16th of an inch over from this fence. We will loosen this clamp. 
we'll nudge the fence over, we'll reclamp it, and then we'll test it again. Let's go. I found that the gap between the back of the fence and the edge of the base was about 1 16th of an inch, so this would be my new alignment point on this end. I used a mallet to tap the fence over and then check to make sure the fence was still flat. Now we can tighten the clamp and test again. Alright, so that adjustment seemed to do the trick. After repeating the five cut method and measuring my strip at the end, um, now I'm measuring with a tape measure, which isn't the most precise measurement tool there is, but from what I can tell, the difference between this end and this end was almost imperceptible uh, with how I was measuring it. So, you know, if anything, I'll say it's less than 1 32nd of an inch different. And if we divide that by four, that's less than one one twenty eighth of an inch over, you know, about 10 inches. So that's pretty good. That's more than accurate enough for me. If your fence is still off more, or if you want to keep fine tuning it, you would just keep repeating that same process until you're happy with it. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead, flip this thing over, drill out the rest of those holes and put screws in to fasten the whole thing and keep it square and in place. I don't glue the back fence down just in case I need to readjust it in the future. And just keep in mind that if you ever do readjust it, you'll want to drill fresh holes because if you use the old holes, it'll pull the fence back into that old position where the screws were. All right, everyone. So thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. I hope you're able to build an accurate crosscut sled that will make your table saw that much more versatile of a tool. See you later.